just please fill this place with your spirit. Give us ears to hear, Father God, and hearts to receive. And you would bless us through the, the teaching tonight, through the, the videos. And uh, Father God, that we come here hungry and expecting something from you, Father God. We love you and we praise you. And we ask that you be glorified here. In your mighty and precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.
sometimes you have days, especially going through a crazy week, where everything just comes up and you just feel overwhelmed and, and like it's too much to handle. And then you read that God will never put you through more than you know you're able to to resist or to handle. And that He's with us; that He'll never leave us or forsake us. If He's for us, then you know whom shall we fear? No one. So whom shall we fear? If He is for us, whom shall we fear? No one. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. No darkness fills the night. You are my soul and she 
Amen. 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 This next song is uh, a song that God is singing to us, in a sense, asking us to come away with Him. It's never too late. It's never too late.
many reasons why we could uh, bless the Lord. This particular song says there's 10,000 reasons. <laughs> Praise God. Bless the Lord.
as our prayer tonight, Father God, I pray that we would just continue to worship you, Father God, um, forevermore. Worship your holy and precious name, Lord. I lift up everyone that's here tonight, Father, that again you would pour out your Holy Spirit. Give us ears to hear, Father God. Help us not to leave your empty hand, Father, that you would speak to us as we uh, go over the, the videos, Father God, that you would help us to be not only hearers of the word, but doers, Father God. Help us to apply what we learn to our lives. Help us to live it, Father God. That we would just step out in faith and just reach on for your glory, Lord, to bring them to you. We love you and we praise you. And we give you thanks for all that you've done, that you're doing, and you're going to continue to do in our lives, Father. And we ask all these things in your mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Alrighty, so... We're going to have announcements. It's the, uh... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, welcome, everyone. Thanks for, uh, again, being here. And uh, again, we're going to go over uh, part two, Francis Chan. So I'm very excited. I'm sure a lot of you are excited. And uh, just a few quick announcements before we get into uh, part two. Phone, cell phones, again, if you have your cell phones, please go ahead and put those on vibrate. If you have that Samsung 3 tablet, uh, Jackie, go ahead and just put that in the car. That thing will light up the whole room. Um, but really quick, you know, just, there are some of the things that are going on led by one. I don't know if you're familiar with them. But it's very important you try to visit the website. For those that go to college, anybody go to college or gone to college? Can you just show a show of hands? Okay. One of the most important aspects about college, besides just going to class, is getting involved, right? Getting involved with the, with the college, getting involved with clubs and sororities. You're actually feeling the climate of that school. The same thing that any ministry or fellowship you're with, it's important you get involved and get plugged in somewhere. And there's many outlets to do that, okay? For example, uh, we have the women's study that's coming up this Saturday, on Saturdays. It's important if you're not plugged in any type of Bible study or women's study or men's study, get involved, get plugged up, Get plugged in. It's important to just fellowship with like-minded people. To just, uh, they say, iron sharpens iron. Um, and Saturday at 11 o'clock here at the ministry. We do have a lounge coming up this Friday. It's the last one of the year. It's going to be an awesome lineup. We've got some great artists coming from around. Um, some from LA. We also have a guest artist. I don't want to mention her name. But it is a female. I'll get figured it out. And so we're excited. It's going to be from 8 to 11.30. But try to be here and support the lounge. And these artists coming out here, they're volunteering their time because they want to share and fellowship with you. So please try to come here and have a great time with us and just uh, enjoy the atmosphere. The rubber sale, November 9th from 7 to 2. Uh, it's going to be an awesome, awesome experience if you, if you are looking for volunteers. So please get connected with Janet, Marina, Michelle, Gina. It's going to be an awesome experience. So just be out here, just being with each other. You know, nothing like, again, nothing better than a heart of a volunteer being out here just serving and getting that stuff sold. Football game again, uh, just so you know, they are 2-0, the first time they got, uh, they're undefeated, actually undefeated, you know, first team didn't show up, but hey, they're undefeated, okay, 3-0, uh, so support that, that's important, start supporting that, it's, it's a great time for them to be out there and, and being a witness to the other players out there, so anything they can do, again, get involved, that's important, so without further ado, I know we're here for uh, Francis Chan and Abe, and Let's welcome Sam Nassar as he walks through those doors. Sam Nassar!
we can just uh, pray for these young ones. All right? Let's bow our heads and pray for them. And Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, and we thank you so much for what you've given us, that you've given us life for you, Lord. And Father, these young ones that are here right now, God, I pray that your hand is upon them, that you just protect them, that you guide them in their life, that you just open up their hearts to see truth and know truth. Father, I pray that you continually just use them. To start with them now, Father. You say, Lord, to bring the children to you at any age, Father. And these children we dedicate to you. Put in your hand, Father. I pray that you just open up their mind, their hearts, their ears. To become more like Jesus, Father. I pray also for the teachers in the classroom, God, that you just give them the patience and the right words and wisdom to use with them. Father, we thank you for everything that we have. Every breath that we take belongs to you. And we dedicate these kids to you as well, Father. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen guys. Amen. you again, Lord, knowing, Father, that this moment that you are sitting in your throne, Lord Jesus, and that you are just completely holy, Father, that you are just completely pure of love, and that you are just there right now, and just we're right before you, God. And there's lightning and thunder, God, that you're just sitting in your throne as we can boldly approach your throne room. And Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit is upon us, God, that your presence is here now. Lord, if there's any sin amongst any one of us that we're dealing with, God, I, I pray for courage that we can confess it before you. So there's no hindrance between you and us. Lord, I pray also that you just open up our hearts to know you. Father, I pray for direction. I pray for wisdom. I pray that you use these videos to speak to us about truly being the church and what it truly means to be a believer and a follower of you. And God, as we uh, come here in the middle of the work week, we have all these stresses in our life, God. I pray that you give us the strength to remove it for this moment and that we can just truly have a heart to lay things down before the cross and trust you with it, not ourselves, Lord. Bless this time of fellowship, bless this time of worship, and bless this time as we just want to give our complete, entire life to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you say hello to somebody? Hello. <laughs>
Jesus Christ, and now you're just made a part of God's family, and you're in God's covering, it's like, then you have nothing to fear. It's like, if God is for you, who could be against you? Right? So is when you truly understand the fear, and he talks about how when the Apostle John, when he, when he was in heaven in Revelation, how he was just fell on the floor as if he was dead because he saw the glory of God. And so one day, we'll, we're going to see that. And so how, how are we going to react when we see that? And then part two is we saw about following Jesus and how you saw in the video how there's like a struggle, how like, you know, you're going in one door and coming out the other. Like, no matter what you're doing in life, it's going to bring you back to the same place. There's, like, there's, there's that constant tug on your heart to follow Christ once you know Jesus. Once you know truth, you can't escape it. And so we saw in the picture that one door with the red, like symbolizing Christ, his, his path or his blood, his path. It's like you're going out one door, coming out the other, and, and, and the world's not going to fulfill your void by any means. It's all, you're always going to chase the carrot until you truly follow the path that God calls you on. And so now part three is called is to deal with the Holy Spirit. So we realize that in life, First, you come to follow, uh, to fear God, and you turn towards God, and then you're like, okay, well, now I'm going to follow God, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, I'm going through my struggles. It's so hard and difficult to follow Jesus. I mean, I'm constantly bogged down by everything, whether it's, it's money or the opposite sex or whatever it is, fame, whatever, and you're trying so hard to follow God, but you realize that I have a hard time, I struggle. I struggle at times. I have a hard time loving people, certain people. I have a hard time dealing with patience with certain people. And it's like, how am I supposed to build this unity with so much diversity? And so God says, hey, listen, I give you my Holy Spirit because you can't do it on your own. And in my upbringing, I never really understood the power of the Holy Spirit. That it's a real, it's God, it's, it's, it's God's spirit. He's a real person. He's personal. He has feelings. He's there. He's real. He's a third person in the Trinity. And a lot of times it's because we don't understand the Holy Spirit that we don't have that empowerment or we don't have that power that God calls us to because we don't really believe it. The Bible says that you. Receive not because you ask not. And a lot of times we don't ask God for the indwelling with the power of the Holy Spirit to get us to do the things that God calls us to. And it's because we just don't know. We never talk about the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit says that He comes to convict us, to change us, to teach us, to unite us, to give us the strength to die to ourselves, to come home with people. When, when Jesus... When Christ prays to the Father, He says, I pray like you and I are one, that they and me are one. So there's complete oneness between us, Christ, the Father, and the Spirit. And so that's the prayer of Jesus Christ that we unite and that we become one. But I have to admit, at times it's difficult to become home with certain people. I struggle. There's anything you guys can do. But if we look at if we look at the scriptures, going over the basic series, this is the basic stuff of the Christian walk. You know, first, if this was God and this is the world, and I'm walking towards the world, I realize that I can never really achieve the world. I realize that there's more in my life, there's more purpose in my life, like there's just something constantly missing. I'm like, man, I feel like I, I need to know my creator. I want to know my God, and all of a sudden I'm like, wow, God, I have this fear of eternity, this everlasting, this not knowing. I finally come to realize, okay, God, wow, you're holy, you're just who you are. And I need Jesus Christ to pay for my sin because I can never earn my salvation. Now I have Jesus Christ. And now I'm trying to walk towards God, and I'm going through that struggle in life, and I'm going five steps forward, two steps back, eight steps forward, a few steps back, and I'm like, I need to move forward. I can't kick these things in my life. I can't kick off the alcohol or the sex or the lust or the 
lying and cheating. And I'm like, God, I need your strength to change from the inside out. And I'm praying for the Spirit. And as I'm growing and maturing, I'm walking a straighter path with God. And, I'm, and all of a sudden, I see other people who are doing the same thing that I'm doing. Now we're going to go to this point of called, something called fellowship. Where now I'm grabbing the hands of those people as well. We're uniting in power and moving toward the same common vision in the same common direction. And in doing so, those that don't believe or know Jesus Christ will see how we as believers are loving each other and forgiving each other and helping each other and giving our all to each other. And they say, wow, we see God in them. We see Christ in them. And it's a basic love story throughout Scripture. And so with Francis Chan, we're saying, wow, well, okay, well, we have a fear, we have now followed Jesus, and now we come to the Holy Spirit. We come to the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times, I have to admit, he'll say it too, it's a lot easier following Jesus on your own, you feel, than it is following the Holy people, because there's so many different personalities. There's so much division or difference in opinion or people or personalities. Accountability. Accountability. But that's not the walk in the Christian faith. Christ said that I created you for fellowship. I created you for unity. And so we look at this as an example, and I think he says it here too, is like imagine for a moment that a guy comes to you and says, you know what, God appeared to me, and he told me, imagine a basketball player, okay? He goes, you know what, God appeared to me, and he filled me with this amazing power to be the best basketball player ever. And now you're seeing him on a court, and there's nothing different about him. Would you believe that? Now imagine us Christians saying, you know, God is in me. He filled me with his Holy Spirit, empowered me. But our life looks nothing different than the, than the actual world. Can we believe that? See, there's, there's something that has to happen. And a lot of times because we're not asking for the Holy Spirit to empower us. We're not asking God to change us. We're not on our face and saying, God, I need you to help me in this area. What's holding us back? What if? What if? we look like the original church? What if the Holy Spirit controlled us and not us trying to control the Holy Spirit? What if? If the Holy Spirit is in me, then I should look different in the world. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. If you go to somewhere like in Africa, I mean, uh, many people from different churches that I know are in parts of the missionary in Africa, and they're saying, man, you just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. People are just moved, they're so on fire, on passion, there's just unity like they never had before. It's like, I'm wondering, wow, is this what power they have that we don't have? It's the same power, the same Spirit. God's the same then as He is today. It's because they're not bogged down by everything else in this world. Complacency, but also it's like you just see like there's like it's not about wealth or security so much. It's, like, it's about just following Jesus, and all of a sudden it's like just they're just amazingly happy, joyful, and they're following God. And there's power. You're seeing miracles like never before. They're so focused. They're so focused. It's the willingness of the heart. And it's allowing the Holy Spirit to control us and not us control the Holy Spirit. And Christ says, you ask not, you receive not because you ask not, right? But then he also said to, you know, to Peter, he goes, you little faith, why do you doubt? A lot of us, we doubt. We don't know the power of the Holy Spirit. We doubt it. And then in Galatians, Paul's telling the, the church, he says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? or by believing what you heard. See, we cannot please God unless we have faith. And so when you believe in the word of Jesus Christ, 
when you believe in him, him saying that I send you one who's going to make you do greater things than I, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? And in John 14, he says, Verily, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. So why, why is it not happening in our life? To be honest, it's a lack of faith. I'm not going to pray for a Ferrari. He says, he says, he says to ask in my name. The Lord's will be done. And when it comes to the spiritual things to glorify God, God says, I will give you. And we doubt, or we don't understand the power of the Holy Spirit, and so we get stuck in this place. Because everything else comes first in our life. And the last verse for me from the video is, is, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anybody, forgive them, so that the Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. You know, we have to come to God with forgiveness. And ask God to come with a pure heart. And when you have that pure heart, do you, you, you want to know what happens? Is your, your prayers become pure. And the will, that, that the prayer requests that you have before the Father become God's will. Not that you change God's will, but your heart will become like His. And so when you ask God, oh my God, give me the strength, give me the power to change my ways. Lord, I'm dealing with this, Lord. Give me the strength to change my desires. I need your Holy Spirit. I cannot do this alone. You have to kind of agree? Fully agree? Yeah? All right, so going into this first video, fear God, Follow Jesus, and now the Holy Spirit. So you have Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in a sense, all intertwining, and then part four is fellowship coming together. And you'll see all this, all right? Can we count the lights, Azar? And we'll watch. Holy Spirit. such a small view of God that they don't see any need to fear Him. And then you've got millions of people who claim to be Christians or followers of Jesus Christ, and yet their lives look nothing like His, and they don't seem to be concerned about it. But, but, but maybe the biggest concern with the church today is this apparent lack of the Holy Spirit's power. I mean, when you read the New Testament, you see that the Holy Spirit was supposed to change everything so that this gathering of people who called themselves Christians had this supernatural element about them, the supernatural power about them. But nowadays, can you really tell the difference? I mean, by the actions of a person who calls himself a Christian versus the actions of someone who denies the existence of Jesus. And do you really see the supernatural power at work when the believers gather together for what we call church? When Jesus was on the earth, he was getting ready to die. He was getting ready to leave and he gathers his disciples together and they're kind of freaking out about this because they're going, wait, Jesus, you're going to leave the earth? And Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry because I'm going to send someone else. In fact, this is going to be to your advantage. It's better than having me on the earth. Imagine hearing those words. If you're one of the disciples, you're thinking, what could be better than having the Son of God next to me? 
I mean, I've, I've seen this guy raise a person from the dead. I've seen him give sight to the blind. I, I've been walking hand in hand with the creator of the universe. And now you're gonna tell me something better? Jesus says, no, this will be better. And in fact, after Jesus dies, he rises from the grave and he gathers the disciples together again. And, and now the disciples are just in awe. And Jesus says, now wait here wait here. I'm going to heaven, but don't worry. Just wait here because the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. Don't, don't, don't go out and try to change the world on your own. You're going to mess everything up. Stay here and wait, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you'll be my witnesses to the rest of the world. So they're in this room, and they're praying, and they're going, Okay, when's he gonna come? When's he gonna come? For, for days and days and days, they're praying, waiting for the Holy Spirit. And then suddenly one day, it, it says that there was this sound, this sound like a rushing wind, so like this hurricane type of sound coming in the room. And then suddenly fire starts coming down from heaven and it's, and it's landing on each of their heads. And you're going, okay, this is it. Then pretty soon everyone in the room starts speaking these different languages. And, and when they walk outside and they're speaking these different languages, during that time there were tons of people from these other nations and they're listening to them going, wait a second, I understand that guy. And, and someone else is going, wait, I understand him. And they're all hearing them in their own languages. It was, it, was a, it was an absolute miracle. And then all these things start happening, right? People start getting healed and, 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 and this group of people start bonding and, 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 and they really just have this supernatural love for one another. It was an amazing, amazing time. And people were drawn, they were drawn to these gatherings because they're saying, what is going on here? I've known that guy my whole life. He's been crippled his whole life and now he's walking. These guys are, are, are doing these supernatural things and, and that's what attracted people to these believers. This is what attracted people to church. jump forward a couple thousand years. Now, you go to a building, someone gives you a bulletin, you sit in a chair, you sing a few songs, a guy delivers maybe a polished message, maybe not, someone sings a solo, you go home. Isn't it the same Holy Spirit that's supposed to be available to us today? Why is it so different? I heard one person say the church nowadays is neither super nor natural. Everything's very predictable and everything is expected. Um, you, you plan, and, and, and there's a truth to that. I mean, I feel bad about it, but being around the church culture and even leading a, a gathering of believers I've gotten pretty good at predicting what's gonna happen in a church service. I can tell you, you know what, hey, this message is gonna be a pretty good one. I think most people like it, or actually some people are gonna have a problem with this. I'm gonna get a lot of emails. You know, oh, the band's gonna sing this song, and at the end, you know, they get it all ramped up, and the, the guitar makes this sound, and everyone's gonna just start, you know, just clapping, applauding right here, or, or I'll go, oh, gosh, she's singing this all day. I don't think it's me that great. You know, it's it's everything so predictable. Was that the way it was supposed to to happen? When, when Jesus says, "No, there's there's a power. There's going to be a supernatural power, and and you are going to receive this supernatural power," and and it was happening. It, it, it was happening. It was seen. It was noticed. In fact, they would say that. People were astonished by the boldness of Peter and John. People were astonished by this courage that those early believers had. When Jesus said this power would come upon you, it really did come upon them, and they were powerful beings. Why is it that in the church, so many people are, are weak or defeated, or, or we get so insecure because we look at ourselves rather than God? It doesn't make sense.
there's this, there's this guy in our church, he's really strong. Um, I, I mean really strong, like he's the strongest guy on earth. Literally, like ESPN did a thing on him where he's the strongest man on earth. He bench presses over a thousand pounds. I mean, this guy is just thick. And, and I remember when we baptized him, you know, the guys had to turn him sideways. And it's, it's just, he's huge, he's huge. But, but what's crazier is his wife. His wife bench presses over 400 pounds. Okay, so imagine, imagine this couple. Okay, what if you saw this couple, and, and I don't even know what their kids look like, but could you imagine what their kids are like? I mean, wouldn't it be weird if their kids were all scrawny and like, hi, you know, I mean, who would be like, are you kidding me? Your dad bench is a thousand, your mom bench is 400, and you're all scrawny, and man, I feel like that's what happens in the church. We believe in this almighty and just intense being, all powerful, and then he puts this spirit of power in us, and our response is, Hi, welcome to church. You know, here's your bulletin. We'll get you out in an hour. Come back next week. I, I mean, really? Is that all God intended for us? And and listen, I get I get insecure if I look at myself. If if I you know if I think ah oh, I, I have to move these people. I gotta try to change these people's lives. And I I get scared. I look at the world and and people are so anti God and so anti the morals He's called us to that sometimes I think to myself, okay, how am I going to change the mindset of all of these people? But, but that's the point. God says, you don't have to do that. That's why I'm sending my Holy Spirit. He's gonna convict the world. When he comes, he's gonna convict the world of their sin. People are gonna know that there's gonna be a judgment. It's about his power. See, Jesus told his disciples, he goes, I, I am gonna build my church and the gates of hell aren't gonna stop this thing. gather together in your families, is it is it predictable? I mean, or, or aren't family reunions those, those things where you never know what's gonna happen? I mean, I'm guessing it's not, oh, I know what's gonna happen. Uncle Bob gets up, he gives a 30 minute speech, and Aunt Sally's gonna sing this song, and then Cousin Joe's gonna pray in prayer, and then we dismiss and we end family. No, no, you just gather together, and there's this dynamic, and there's this, uh, we don't know what's gonna happen next. See, there was a sense in which the church was supposed to be like that. It was supposed to be just a bunch of people coming together, but, but there was gonna be a supernatural element to it where God himself would create a unity amidst them. They would be so tight, they would be so bonded together that the world would look and go, wow, how do they all join together like that? Because typically a bunch of people can't get in a room and get along there would be this harmony. Why? Because they were all following the same Spirit. See, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to create within our gatherings. It's supernatural. It's something that was just happening. It was almost happening to them as they followed Him. It's, it's, it's like, you know, when, when you surf, you don't make a wave. You don't get everyone together and go, hey, let's spark. You don't know when the wave's coming. It just, it just happens, it moves, and, and, and once you're on it, it's got a power of its own. You, you don't manipulate it, you just, you just go along for the ride, and you multiply that a thousand times, and that's what you see in the book of Acts. It's like this wave of God's power, and everyone's just jumping on before just going, what is going on here? This is so powerful, this is so amazing, and it's what the Holy Spirit is doing. It was.
wasn't for 2,000 years ago only. It's for right now. The Holy Spirit wants to lead us. He wants to lead us into something deeper. But do you believe it? I mean, honestly, do you even think it's possible today? Do you really believe the same Holy Spirit exists today and wants to do that in your life, wants to do it in my life, and He wants to create this gathering today, a gathering where He works so powerfully that we would actually experience that power and recognize there's a powerful God up there and we would just naturally fear Him. Don't you, don't, doesn't your soul long for this gathering of people where the Holy Spirit leads us into the ways of Jesus and as we follow the ways of Jesus, we find new life and a new excitement to, to our existence. And don't you want it? This is everything in you scream wanting to be a part of something supernatural that you know the Holy Spirit is leading and He creates this unity amidst this body of followers of Jesus. I think it's what we all want, but we've got to believe and we've got to live like we believe it. We need to pray like we believe it. I mean, what would the church look like today if we really stopped taking control of it and let the Holy Spirit lead? I believe this is what we all want. And I believe this is exactly what the world needs to see. Each other and then stop again. 
Yeah. I think also what Charles said too that you know it's because we don't understand how much power is available to us. And I know we say the word power to be like you know a Pentecostal or a charismatic falling out of floor crazy. No, it's not like that. You know, there, there, there's, there's a real active spirit that we at times don't understand. And because we don't understand it, we kind of become afraid of it. Or we're not sure how or what in the world to do to get like okay, hold on, I feel weird or think weird. You know, I see people on TV and get like a false implication of what the spirit supposed to be doing, and now I'm nervous. So I, you know, I'm afraid to act out or to ask God for certain revelation because I'm, I'm just unaware of it. So that's why God says that we're called to constantly study the scriptures and to learn and look at and look how the spirit works, you know, especially in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is how the church should act. Acts. Right? I think Sam was on last time too, which is pretty powerful too, because you know, when we ask the question, you know, why don't people have this, you know, what is it that we're lacking? I think Sam said something to the point of like, you know, we just don't know the power that's available. How I told the same just now. You know, and I think we're just we just don't understand it. So we just want to get the word and hopefully do our best to live it. But if we understand truly the power of the Holy Spirit and we live it, if we see or just understand it, our lives would change. We would pray more in faith and ask God to truly change us. Sorry, I just have a quick question. Um, when it comes to asking like, for change, there are times, I'm just going to keep using me because I'm not going to try to go now and I've experienced it. I'm not sure I'm not sure. No. Um, there are times where I'm fully aware, and I'd be praying, and I'm doing good, you know, I'm involved, whatever it is, and I'm, I feel change is happening in my life for the better. I feel that I am following Christ, I'm praying about it, everything, but I get into a situation where mentally, and my heart is telling me no, I have no desire to do, like, what it is, be it a worldly thing, okay, but that my body is doing it, yeah. and I'm knowing I don't want to do it, but I'm allowing myself to do it. Yeah. So there's a part of you that feels like you're not worthy of the power of the Holy Spirit. That sure. makes sense. And that's the enemy of the world. Sure. You feel like and, and that's what the devil does. That, yeah, and that's what the enemy does. You know, we war against the flesh. You know, <laughs> and, and of this world, right? You guys understand that? From last service, we put that that this whole struggle, this cosmic struggle, is started in the garden in the Garden of Eden, right? Mm -hmm. Where now the enemy is trying very hard to use every tool possible. To separate you from God, however you can. And even if it means just keeping you stagnant, where you're not moving or growing forward, that to him is better than you growing. And so if look at even the very first verse, uh, the very first fellowship part, one piece, the second word, so that they devoted themselves. You know, it's a, it's a, it means that we're called to devote. And the word devote is a lot of that to devote. And so if our morning are devoted or our day is devoted or our nights are devoted to truly growing and going over the, the teachings of Christ, it's like you're you're now putting up a sword. You know, and the teaching is just that the word of God is a sword. And so it allows us to fight off those things of our flesh and we know it's the flesh or our body. Hopefully that makes sense, but you know, we, we have to say, you know what? What's most important to me? What's most important to me? And, and, and we all can say, oh, you know, what's important to me is, is, is God, you know, and then my family, and then my kids, or, or, or whatever you have. But ultimately, it's, it's putting God first. But if, if God truly is first, is you know, not in any guilt trip kind of way, it's how much time are you devoting to God? You know, it's like, so you have this question, okay, so... If you, this is a long time ago, if you had two dogs, one you constantly fed for two weeks, and the other one you neglected and you don't feed it, and now they're going to fight, who's going to win? The strong one. One that's fed. And so we, in the same sense, are in that same struggle. We have, are we feeding our spirit, or are we feeding our flesh? So now when it's time to where they're going to compete or fight, which one's going to win? It's the one you feed the most. Right? So we have to be devoted. We have to be feeding our spirit. We have to be. You know, and it's, it's not, yes, coming to church on a Wednesday or to a Sunday as, as those all great things. But, you know, 
We have to be daily, constantly communion with God. God said that, and if you look at the book of Acts, they would go daily and commune with people. They'd break bread and have fellowship and just, and, and we need that. Whether you put on K-Wave, 107.9, or using your scriptures, or using prayer and meditation, whatever you do, we have to constantly do that, or else the world will just kind of tear us apart. Tear us apart. <laughs> but now going into uh, fellowship. So as you see right now, you see the three coming together. And, and you one faced the fear, you had the drowning water, one was following Christ with the struggle, now the Holy Spirit's coming in, and you saw how uh, the kind of whirlwind, and now like there's a power that's just like, don't know where it's coming from. And now you're going to see all three of them come together and create this fellowship. Create the fellowship. So these three people, in a sense, they fall in love with God. Right? And, uh, You'll see that this, this whole series is a constant sequence of one like long movie in a sense, where it's taking all seven aspects. But one thing is, you can't change on your own. You know, you guys all know that. The reality is that I can't change on my own. No matter how much I try, I truly can't truly change permanently on my own. Permanently on my own. It's not going to happen. So. I gotta admit, at times I lack in my prayer life. I lack, and I ask, I, I lack at times. My to, I'm tired or just whatever I'm going through. I'm like, okay, you know, I'll just pray quickly, and you know what? The next morning, man, I just feel it, feel the heaviness. You know, it's like we gotta really spend time in asking God for true change in us. You know, we create like a routine, and our routine becomes like mundane. Just, it's just there. And then now, if you don't do it, you feel guilty. Or, you know, I feel like I'm just kind of feeling distant. But if, if you truly are, are living and is walking with Christ, I mean, man, like, change occurs when you're asking God continually to give you the strength to change. Continually. Whereas perpetually. So with this, with this fellowship, one thing you're going to see coming up right now is that they were had all one heart, one soul, one mission, one purpose. Us as the church, we all should have one heart, one soul, driving the same purpose. Driving the same purpose. Um, and one, the one part is that you know, a few of you guys have expressed that people that you know, and your family, your friends. They want to know more about God because they saw the change in you and how much you love people and how much you've forgiven. And I'm like, that's what it's all about. You know, we have a hard time forgiving each other here. You know, it's like, how, how are we going to reflect Christ if, if we can't even do what Christ calls us to? So we, the more that we fall in love with God, have a fear follow, and just have the Holy Spirit ask for change, we're going to forgive each other, grow, and just harmonize and create this unity. That the world says, well, I want more of that. And now we're drawn together as one unit moving forward together. And so it goes in the same way, too, with marriage and your kids. You know, like, you've got to have that unity. You know, you, you know within, even in, in the worldly aspect, you've got to have unity within your marriage within your kids, the stronger you become. The same thing with the church, you gotta have unity. And you're not gonna have it unless you have the Holy Spirit. And once you have that unity, you create fellowship, true, genuine fellowship. Genuine fellowship. We're gonna get to video two. You want a quick break, you guys good? Yeah? You wanna stand real quick? You don't fall asleep on me? All right. And then after this video, When you first realize what God is like, it's very natural and proper to respond in fear or even terror. 
But then God explains to you, look, there's nothing else you have to fear in life now. And now you are my child and it's an amazing feeling. And then he says, and I want you to follow Jesus. I want you to be like him. I want you to live like him. And, and you realize, wow, following Jesus, that means I, I, I give everything up. But then you realize, no, this, this is worth it. This is a good thing. This is what I want to do. But at times it, it, it may even feel overwhelming or impossible. And Jesus says, that's why I'm giving you my spirit. He's gonna empower you, he's gonna lead you, and he's gonna enable you to accomplish this mission that I've given you on this earth. And, and so when you begin to understand these, these three interwoven entities, it's, it's like your whole world has to change. And it, it, it's like all these years you've been living one way, you've been thinking just about yourself and doing your thing, and now you realize you're a part of something bigger. It's like stepping into a whole new world because now you've got a mission. But what is that mission? Jesus made it clear, he says, after he rose from the grave, he says, I want you to go and I want you to obey everything that I commanded you, but I also want you to teach others to obey everything that I've commanded. This is what we call discipleship. And Jesus said, he said, I want you to go and I want you to make disciples of all the nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to teach them to obey everything that I commanded you to do. While I understood that, I, 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 I never understood something until later on in my life. As I read in the scriptures, I realized God doesn't want me to do this by myself. He, he, he doesn't want me just to follow him on my own. That's why he created church, the church. He says, now you're part of a group of people. You don't do this by yourself. See, see, in my mind, when I thought of church, I would think of a building or I would think of a service, but when you read the Bible, that's not what it's talking about. In fact, if Jesus was on the earth right now and, and you ask Jesus, hey, where's the church? He's not gonna give you an address or point to a building. He would explain, no, the church, those are the people on this planet who fear me, who follow me, and are filled with the Spirit. We now, before God, should have a fellowship together, a sharing, not just of thoughts, ideas, but a sharing of everything to really care for one another. And that's this idea of, of fellowship. It's, it's sharing as a family, it's sharing as a, like, like a body, like a temple, we're, we're, we're part of something bigger. And, and this word fellowship is so huge in the Bible. And, and this drives me crazy because for so much of my life, it was almost like an afterthought. When I would think of fellowship, I would think, oh, there was that one part of the church building called the Fellowship Hall, and, uh, and, and after, uh, after our gathering on Sunday morning, we would go in the Fellowship Hall, and one guy would bring dessert, another guy would bring cupcakes, another guy would bring some meat, another, you know, and we'd have this thing called the potluck in the Fellowship Hall, and so that meal together was fellowship, or, or in church we would have fellowship night where, where we get together and play softball, and, and so to us, that's fellowship. But in the Bible, man, it is so much more intense than that. In the Bible, man, there's this, this, this awesome passage in, in Acts 4, verse 32, and it says that the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And then it says it's that no one, no one claimed that any of his possessions belonged to himself, but instead that they would, uh, they, would, they would share everything in common and they would give as people had need. There was a sense of mission together. This is what he meant by fellowship.
Now that's, that's a lot different from a potluck. It's this idea that we're one now. We're family. There was this guy um, that came to my church once and, and he was a part of a gang and, uh, and decided to ditch everything and, and follow Jesus and he got baptized. And after a while though, he stopped coming to the, the church gatherings. And, and one of my buddies asked him, they go, hey, what, where you been? He, he says, when I got baptized, he goes, I thought that it was gonna be like when I got jumped into the gang. He goes, when I got jumped into my gang, he goes, suddenly everyone had my back. We became like a family 24 seven. He says, so when I got baptized, I thought this is what's gonna happen with the Christians. He goes, I, I didn't know that it was just Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. He goes, I thought it was gonna be family. So he goes, I, I just had it wrong in my head. And yet when I heard that, I thought, no, you got it right. We've got it wrong. And, and honestly, it was heartbreaking because I thought the gangs are a better picture of family than the church is? The gangs are a better picture of the body than, than we are? They're having a fellowship and a sharing that we don't see in the church of Jesus Christ. And yet that's the very thing that Jesus wanted for us. You see, even this mission that we've been sent on, he says, we together were supposed to together proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. This idea of, of, of proclaiming it, I, I can't do that without other people. See, I can talk about Jesus. I can talk about Jesus by myself, but I can't show Jesus to other people. Here's what I mean, I can tell you, Jesus forgives you, Jesus forgives you, Jesus is forgiving. But that's not enough. God says, I want you to show Jesus to the world. So that means I need my brothers and sisters around me and we offend one another, but we keep forgiving. And then suddenly the world looks on and goes, man, I've never seen that before. You guys just keep forgiving each other. You see, unity is so strange in our world. We live in a time when people are so quick to ditch one another. God says, I want my church to be different. I want this one group of people that are devoted to sharing their lives together, sharing this mission together. When someone offends you, you forgive them. And then suddenly people are seeing the attributes of Christ. They're seeing it in the flesh. It's almost like that. what Jesus did in putting God to flesh so that we could dwell amongst him, he says, now that's the church's responsibility. I want you to love each other so much. And when you do that, they'll actually see God. His plan was fellowship. His plan, he says in John 17, when Jesus is praying, he, he says to God, he goes, I and them, you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me. There's something about our unity that makes the message believable. And that's why we can't do it by ourselves. Look, if I'm perfectly honest, I am far more comfortable doing this by myself. It's a lot easier. I don't have to put up with different personalities and, 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 and different arguments. It's, it's just nicer. Let me just have my own relationship with God. But God says, that's not what I designed you for. Here's the mission, I need you to show Jesus to the world by the way that you interact with one another and love one another. So if I'm to accomplish this mission that God's given me, I need others with me. I gotta have them with me. And if you think about it, this is how he designed human beings. We weren't meant to live in isolation. And this completely flies in the face 
of those who say, I've got my relationship with God. I don't need the church. I don't need, you know, these little gatherings or, you know, I love Jesus. I just hate the church. We can't say that. You're going against everything Jesus asked you to do. God says, I designed you to be together. It's so beautiful when you work together and have one heart, one mind, one soul. And he says, and I'm going to do this. The beautiful thing, Jesus said 2,000 years ago, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't stand against it. I will create this type of supernatural unity and gathering. And, and so it's not something that we have to force like, okay, let's, let's do the fellowship thing. Let's make it happen. No, God says, I'm going to make it happen. And the question is, is do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to have this sharing, this fellowship that God intended for his church? Or do you want to continue living in isolation? It's an exciting time right now because I'm seeing God just bring people from all the different, all different parts of the world and they're all having the same conviction of church was meant to be more. There was supposed to be a greater unity and everyone's feeling the same thing. Everyone's sensing the same thing going, the way we've been doing it doesn't seem biblical. When I read in the Bible, there should be a deep love. It's not just a bunch of people coming in a room and staring forward. It's a family, it's a body. And I'm talking to these people, it's, it's been really weird where they're going, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm thinking. We're all thinking the same thing. Why? Because there's one spirit and he's leading us all to this conviction of things have got to change. There needs to be this fellowship in the church again. And this is something Jesus is doing. you fear God and you've decided to follow Jesus with your life and you really have his spirit in you, then you're my brother, you're my sister. Like in God's eyes, when he looks down, he sees us as family and he wants us to live that way. And that's what he means by fellowship. Makes you think, huh? Makes you really think that you guys are actually my brothers and my sisters. It's like, you know what I love about Francis Chan is that he, he's very relational. He makes God so personal. And I think we lose that when we just were caught up in all these traditions, that we kind of lose the personal God in our life, and that we lose the oneness we're supposed to have, you know? that we're called to be family, not like my brother is beating me up when I was growing up. We're called to love each other differently, right? Um, we have one more handout regarding fellowship. And again, it's just to help you reflect, you know, whether you write on it or not, or you talk about it with your spouse or your kids, or even by yourself. You know, just take the time and do so. If you have part one and two, you need a copy of it, I'll get you a copy of it. 
try to do in order to help it. It's like steps, how building steps and so forth. Does anybody have anything that they want to say just regarding spirit or fellowship or, you know, you want to come up here and say a couple words, just thoughts on your heart? Anybody? Anything? Sure. Um, well, me and my sister that have been like best friends since obviously we were just, we were kind of like partners in crime, but now we're just best friends. And we we're blessed to meet Karina. And I can honestly say, me and my sister have always had this struggle, but it's different when you see someone outside of your home dealing with the same things and wanting the same like change. So with her, we've actually gotten so far. Like we're both, me and her, at a standstill in our life. And it's kind of the same exact standstill. But we, we never met. We had like a different walk of life. And by coming together, we have come such a long way than we did by ourselves. And we're kind of our, like, our, what is that? It's like when you push yourself and get back on track. Like we nudge each other. We're, those things at the bowling alley, so we're all the way in the Like if I see her slipping or falling, we're not seeing something that I am from the outside because I'm stronger that week for some reason. I let her see it and vice versa. And with that, I think we've gained such a greater understanding of the relationship God intended with us. Because alone, honestly, I thought I knew and tradition and I heard what my parents would say and I saw it at the church, but it was never as intimate as it is now because I have a friend kind awesome. of nudging me in the same way. So I think yeah, it's really very important. Iron sharpens iron. So, so what do you think that we can do as a, as a body? Like, What can we do to create a different type or a more intimate fellowship with each other? Like, what, what it, you know, I know it's probably un, it's not normal to come and ask you guys, but you know, hey, this is, this is, Christ is the head of this church, and, you know, we're, we're all here together, you know, and, and so I want to create that environment, and I'm so used to seeing church being you know, X, Y, Z, being a certain formality, but that's, I feel like that, you know, again, like, I'm trying to control the spirit, like, I'm trying to control what God's trying to move in us, and so, like, I want to be able to let the spirit flow more if we can, or create an environment amongst each other. But we can really have the iron sharpened iron. We can actually grow and pray together, be there for each other. And I know it's hard. We're here on a Wednesday night, you know. But if you have any ideas or thoughts, please talk to me or email me. Because I just really want to engage more with you guys. You know, like it's just been in my heart for a very, for a very long time. Even about a year ago, I feel like I'm like God. There's so much more to church, and. Uh, Watching this video like 15, 20 times, I'm like, man, you know, like this is more so confirmation. I'm like, God, what do I do? You know? And so, uh, yeah, hey, lounge is a really good thing. Lounge school. I, I went to my first one last month. And I was amazed. I mean, this didn't even look like this place in here. And cool. just, and uh, I met a lot of people there that I was senior at Bible study as well. And I think there's really nice, nice fellowship there. So that, that lounge. Is Really good. Awesome. Well, that's good to know, Adam. Um, well, the things that, well, when I was a kid, we used to do a lot of barbecues. I mean, maybe on Saturday or something. Some people had a time in two, three weeks. They had, you know, 11 hours of things. get together at a park. And barbecue and awesome. fellowship there. Awesome. Here, there's food. So, like, additional gatherings and stuff? Awesome. That'd be cool. <laughs> um, I think that we're going to like the first step in my opinion But I think we like to get there. We need to kind of have trust in each other. Like we could count on me venting, for example, to Chuck, and not worrying about being judged or seen differently or talked about, but just to rely on good advice that will help me. I think it should be like a hotline. <coughs> people do. Yeah. Some people take turns. So whoever knows is on the line. If it's a girl my age, she'll call me when I'm on the hotline, and I can relate to her. Vice versa, if a grown woman. A woman that's going through something with her husband or family, or you as a man who needs some, you know, like take turns that way we all talk to each other. We'll make a sticky note. Good idea. Yeah, um, I think that we should try to make an effort uh, every Wednesday.
oh, to yeah. say hi and actually maybe conversate with new faces to kind of welcome them and, and feel, feel the warmth and the fellowship. Yeah, you know, actually saying that, you know, a lot of times we, we kind of like almost fellowship afterwards a little bit and it's late, it's a weeknight. But maybe try getting there early to hang out and fellowship beforehand, mm -hmm. before study starts, and then come and study. Yeah, you know? So it's more time together. And, and, and I go ahead and that, that's only on a Wednesday. The reality is this, you know, I, I know we have families, I know we have work, I know we're bogged down by things, but really it's making the effort to, even just a phone call, get, you know, exchange numbers and just pray with someone, so just, just to hang out, so you know, just give them a call and gather Zoom, we can all make time for that, you know? Yeah. I think that oneness, that closeness, that love, that, and I think it needs to start with each one of our hearts to ask for to forgive us for our hearts towards certain, towards others, because if our hearts are wrong, it's still never going to be good. We won't be good. So true. And, yeah. and, that's, and that's what you were saying earlier, is that when we have unforgiveness, when we really are not going to move spiritually, and so we need the Holy Spirit in order to create unity amongst different personalities. You know, even like, like you know, the word university is creating unity within diversity. You know, and that's man's common goal, is how do you unite amongst the diversity of each other. And that can only happen with the power of the Holy Spirit. So, like, you know, that's a good point, is that we have to ask God, like, like King David, or how he had David. You see, he had God, it's like, open up my heart to me. Show me my issues, and let, let me deal with it. Let me just ask and repent and give me the strength to do so. That's a really good point, too. Show us our issues. It's our issues. Show us our issues. Show you our issues, exactly. Show me Gina's issues. Show me your issues. It's my heart. It's my anger. That's right. That's right. You know? I'm saying fix that, fix that, fix that. And then you'll realize the more that you're asking God to help you, you realize the more selfless you become. And the more selfless that you become, the more you unite with people. It's not about my ego, my pride, hey, how are they looking at me? Or I want the attention, or hey, they hurt my feelings. You let go of all that, and you realize that you're becoming one with that person because it's no longer about you, it's about them. About them. Sam, I have something you want to say? You yeah, know, I'm just going to say that, what was the original question that you, that you asked everyone? What can we do to kind of create that environment where where we have more of that true, genuine fellowship amongst us believers. So I, I think the answer is really simple, but we've made it complex. We've made it complex. There's a lot of great suggestions, and I think those are all, they were very good suggestions. I think they were, they were nibbling at the road, or at, at, the, at the real answer. And I, I think the simple answer is, is who is God? When we say, who is God? God is love. Okay? So, I think to get to the point that you just asked about, how do we get closer, how do we fellowship better, is to love each other. And it's deeper than that. It's, what does it really mean to love each other? What, what does it really mean? I think if each and every person asks themselves the question, what does it mean for me to really love this person? It could be a person I don't know. It could be a person I don't like. What does it mean for me to really love them? Does it mean that I'm going to, I'm going to step into their lives and walk alongside them? Does it mean that I'm going to have empathy towards them and relate to their pain, relate to their struggles, relate to their, to their, their life, whether they're going through something tragic or something or they're looking for a job? How can I really walk alongside them and and be there with them. And I think the simple answer is loving them. But with a, with a love that is like someone said, unconditional, it's it's really simple. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bunch of different activities, so to speak, but it's more of a, it's almost like changing the way you think about people. You know, it's a more process, I agree. And so, 
the the more real time you spend with someone, the more you, you know. Sure. But so, so the root of it all comes down to love, right? So we're called to love God first, all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love one another as Christ has loved us, right? But a lot of us don't know how to love. Because maybe we're brought up in an upbringing where we don't understand true love or how to love someone unconditionally. So we got to live to see how Christ loved. And so how Christ gave himself. So as we grow, it's a process that we go through, right? The, the closer you become to Christ, the more mature you become spiritually, the greater your love is for people. And so we have to continually be in that moment, you know, be in that mindset of, hey, I want to draw close to Christ so I can draw close to you. And so if you don't have Christ, you're not going to have that love for one another. True love. So it comes down ultimately ultimately to love. But it's like, you know, what, what can we do to create that environment? You know, because there's people here that you have a hard time dealing with. Maybe on the same section in the room. I don't know. But it's just that, you know, hey, when you start thinking about, okay, how can I love this person? Like if Christ was next to me in this moment, how would Christ want me to act with this person? How can I really truly be the one with that person? I think a lot of times um, we come to church, we come to uh, see what we can get out of it, like, like to be served instead of coming to serve. I know Jesus, he came not to be served, but to serve. He watched his disciples' feet. And um, as you, you know, he says that we're to esteem others above ourselves and, um, you know, to serve others. So if I, you know, um, demonstration of love is to serve my brother, if we all come with that heart to serve one another, um, I think that's going to be a, a good thing. And it reminds me of a, someone spoke about like a picture, it was a, a picture, a drawing of, of what hell would be like. It's a bunch of people sitting at a table with spoons and forks in their hands, and their hands are like tied to one another, and everybody's fighting, and the table's full of food, and everybody's fighting, trying to feed themselves, and, you know, no one's able to eat because they're trying to feed, feed themselves. And then the picture of heaven was the same layout, same table with all kinds of food, you know, people a, a, a fork in one hand and a spoon in the other, and their hands are tied to one another, but in this picture, they weren't trying to feed themselves or feed each other. So as we feed each other, not only you know food, but uh, in prayer and in, in word, um, we watch one another and, and love one another. Um, that creates a unity. Awesome. awesome. Last one, Austin. I you can build a castle on sand, but actually, okay. Paul. I think that really comes down to destroying foundations the enemy set up misconceptions of what the church itself is. Like Chan was saying, it all comes down to kind of not building um, but the people itself and the church of Christ. So with that I think that you have to eradicate the ignorance which is just not knowing um, of certain things which we've been taught things for so long. We've seen it we accept it as a a lot of churches compromise to have the Bible the culture. You know, um, and we should really have ourselves, we should have a culture that the Bible, the national, a lot of these things should. It's what we should be doing. But to address the question directly, okay, it's just all those inconsistencies and all the compromises we lay on. So I think mean, we feel what the actual church is and all that. Oh, we got a timing. Yeah. Mom, Julie? I'm sorry, Julie. Actually, you know, you know, I cut you off earlier. I apologize. No, but, you know, you see how I did the what why stuff.
I pray for true forgiveness upon us, Lord, so that, that we can forgive others, Lord. And God, as we're just being humble to your word, I just pray that your Holy Spirit move in us, God, that you just give us a, a better revelation of your Holy Spirit, that we're not afraid to believe in your power, that we can take off any preconceived notion or biasness, Lord, of the church, that we can truly live as the church. Father, may we just not walk out this building just taking away a good video. May we truly reflect on it, Lord. I pray for those tonight that are sick in here, Lord. May you put your hand upon their bodies, God. May you give them a quick recovery. And Father, as we uh, just close and give our offerings, Lord, we pray that we have the right heart and the right attitude as we give. May we give to grow your kingdom, Lord. May you bless the finances of this place. May it all be used 100% for your glory. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.